chapel on Sunday mornings and really was influenced greatly by Dr. Johnson. He went up to Philadelphia to get his PhD or his, his, uh, his, his doctorate and was in the pastorate for many years. So he has the background of a pastoral ministry and also a great deal of scholarship. And if you were here yesterday afternoon for his lecture on the American Revolution, you got a good sampling of that, and uh, I was very impressed, and I learned a lot of things uh, about that event that uh, I had not known, and was very appreciative of Dr. Lilbach's lecture. By the way, you can get that if you weren't there it, uh, on uh, DVD. Uh, it's recorded, and it's going to be, uh, I don't know when it's going to be put out, but you will be able to get that lecture. Uh, Dr. Lilback, as I said, is president of Westminster Theological Seminary. He is also the professor of historical theology there. And so I'm going to turn it over to Peter now because we're going to use the full hour for a lecture. And it's different from what you have in the bulletin, but I'm going to let Peter explain that. So, Peter, it's great to have you back. be back with uh, my home church in Dallas, Texas. That's the Believer's Chapel. What a pleasure to be here. And uh, I was planning to uh, do a study on Micah chapter 4, which I did at the Bible study up in Oklahoma City with uh, your good friend Mike Black. And then for the uh, George Whitfield Society lecture, uh, they had uh, proposed that I might do a study on the issue of climate change. And now, you know, say, so climate change, what, what do I do? Everybody's talking about it, but I know nothing about it. But he gave me enough lead time. He's been asking me to do this for like three or four years, and finally, you can't say no to Mike Black. You know that, if you know Mike. He's, he's an overwhelming force of nature, and he just finally said, okay, I've got to do it. So with great fear and trepidation, I started working on it. And having delivered it, he said, please deliver it to the folks at Believer's Chapel. And I said, oh, if you really want me to, I will. And uh, your pastoral team has consented for me to change. I know when, the, when you put something in the bulletin, it's the law of the, of the Medes and Persians, and you can't change it. So my head should be chopped off, but I've gotten an exemption. I, I don't know if this is a believer's chapel indulgence that I've been given here, but here I am. So it's my joy to share it with you. And as I do this, I want to emphasize just a couple things. Number one, uh, I am not an expert in this field. So many things I might say, you might say, we didn't get it right. I'm very open. I get criticized all the time. That's part of the job of a president, by the way. You know, you got to have a lightning rod somewhere and then kick somebody. So that's part of my job description. But uh, if I don't get it all right, it's okay. But on the other hand, laymen in all areas need to look at issues around them and try to get the Bible and say, does the Bible give us wisdom on it? That's part of having a firm reliance on the scriptures, having a world and life view that's shaped by God's word. We believe God's word is true and it gives us wisdom. So I'm going to try to do that for you today. And as we do it, I also want to make clear uh, that I don't believe for a moment I can be legitimately described as a climate denier. I'm going to say I believe in climate change. And I'm going to explain to you that the Bible teaches that. It's part of the Bible's re uh, revelation and we need to take the Bible seriously. Further, I want you to know I'm not an anti-environmentalist. I'm a certified tree hugger. I, I've hiked uh, the Appalachian Trail uh, seg segments three or four summers. I've hiked, uh, you don't see many trees in the Grand Canyon, but I love rocks too. I've, done, I've hiked all the way across the Grand Canyon and back one week. Uh, I love the outdoors. I've climbed volcanoes. I've hiked in Tibet. I've been in India in the Himalayas. I, I love the outdoors. I love the environment. So if you say I'm a, a climate denier and I hate nature, you need to go back and take that extra hour of sleep you lost because you weren't listening. Uh, I, I love nature. But the question we have to look at today is, what do we hear? What is true? And then what does the Bible say about it? So this is the issue. So my title today is called Climate Change and the Unchanging Word. Because I'm speaking to something that I don't have a great mastery of, I'm going to rely on my manuscript more than I usually do. So forgive me for reading a lot, but I think it's better to try to be accurate than to just be educationally fun, okay? So it's a little bit scholarly, but not too much, I hope. So let's, let's begin. 
Following a long-standing ecclesiastical tradition, the moderator of the Church of Scotland presents a Bible to the new British monarch in the coronation service. When he does, he declares, this book is the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. Now, those words reflect the spirit of the translators of the King James Bible. And when they wrote their work and completed it in 1611, they said, God's sacred word is that inestimable treasure that excelleth all the riches of the earth. That biblical worldview, of course, begins with what we read in Genesis 1, verses 26 and following, which is often called the creation mandate. Uh, we read this as follows. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very Good. You know those words. That's the biblical worldview. It's where the story starts. God is the creator. He gave us this nature to enjoy it, to have a rule over, and to do it because it's very good. It is his gift to his people who are made in his image. But times have changed. The Bible is now scandalized by prevailing worldviews as the source of dangerous notions that are inflicting inestimable damage on the biosphere. Whether secular, uh, secular or Marxist, these perspectives insist that humanity inhabits a godless and endangered earth. Their ideology dominate the news, politics, and academia with shibboleths such as global warming, climate change, overpopulation, and the evils of fossil fuels. The call of previous Christian generations to save souls has been eclipsed by the mainstream mantra of save the planet. We encounter unrelenting declarations of the looming extinction of life due to catastrophic global warming and the inundation of earth by rising seas. The prophets of climate change pronounce the inevitable death of the planet unless immediate, radical, global action is taken. Although for some, they believe it's already too late. These views are reinforced by legislators and academics, by attempting to curtail free speech, by the imposition of so-called safe zones, protecting progressives from themes inconsistent with their ideology. Christian teachings are banished from such, and historic biblical beliefs are condemned as hate speech. Beliefs in a sovereign creator and his grant of a privileged planet to be ruled by humans are repudiated. Post-Christian Western culture is now avowedly anti-Christian. And so as we talk about this theme of climate change and the unchanging word, I want to give you this, the themes that I'm going to try to pick up briefly. First of all, we're going to talk about the culture of climate change. Secondly, what I'm calling the inconvenient truths challenging climate change doomsday scenarios. Thirdly, I'm going to speak about engaging observable realities regarding climate change. Fourthly, how does the Bible help us? Redemptive historical theological issues addressing the issue of climate change as believers. Fifthly, the Bible's clear answer to the foundational question of climate change, that is, can mankind destroy the divine order of nature? And then lastly, a biblical evalu evaluation of climate change claims. Now, I can only uh, surf quickly over these themes, but I hope I can touch each of them briefly today. And I thank you for giving me the full hour to try to cover it. So let's begin with this first theme, the culture of climate change. Contemporary culture is engulfed by concerns of climate change. Rising oceans have brought a rising tide of dire warnings of an impending apocalyptic climate tsunami resulting in the destruction of life. Global warming claims were given widespread respectability by Al Gore's 2006 
Academy Awards winning documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. The message of global doom has led to the recent celebration of teenager Greta Thunberg as the spokesperson for climate change. Her famous declarations include statements such as the following, I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic and to act as if the house was on fire. She says, you say you love your children above all else, and yet you are stealing their future in front of their very eyes. She says, you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? If you really understood the situation and still kept on failing to act, then you would be evil. And then she says, for more than 30 years, the science has been crystal clear. How dare you continue to look away and come here saying that you're doing enough when the politics and solutions needed are still nowhere in sight. You are failing us. But the young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, I say we will never forgive you. Wow. The gauntlet has been thrown down. Thunberg was selected as Time Magazine's 2019 Person of the Year, following her condemnation of global older generations at the United Nations, who she claims have stolen her childhood through indifference and inactivity regarding the approaching cosmic doom of climate change. Reports appear of children unable to sleep due to fearful nightmares about climate change. News reports are heard of teenagers screaming in anger and terror at climate change rallies at the corrupt capitalist business and energy systems run by selfish older people. Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, has apparently heeded these pleas and has announced his commitment of $10 billion to fight climate change. That's $10 billion with a B. Stop and think about how much uh, Mr. Bloomberg did with half a billion dollars. He almost got himself nominated to the presidency. Multiply that by 20. Get ready for what's coming. You think we've heard a lot about climate change? It's going to be 10 times, 20 times more. Politically, Americans are confronted with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's prognostication of the final decade of life on Earth unless the Green New Deal is enacted. Climate deniers are scolded and scorned by the insistence that all scientists hold that global warming, or at least climate change, is an undisputed fact that imperils the habitability of the earth. Exxon may have now for escaped culpability in court for its alleged role in the climate catastrophe. Nevertheless, it is certain in the minds of many that the Trump administration has accelerated the ending of life on earth by foolishly quitting the Paris Climate Accords. Now, this is just the news we've all been hearing. I'm not making any of this. This is just stuff I plucked right out of popular sources and I've heard myself. Emanating from this perspective, there are increasing demands to end fracking, claiming it's destroying the environment. Pipelines that advance North American reserves of natural gas and oil are resisted and claim to pollute the environment. It matters not that these energy developments are consciously constructed with concerns for environmental safety. The geopolitical significance of their creation is ignored. Such new energy production and distribution have made the U.S. a net energy exporter after decades of being dependent on others, thereby vastly diminishing the influence of Russia over Europe. Moreover, it has dried up Western petrodollars, previously harnessed for terrorist activities by groups that perpetrate violence from bases operated throughout the Middle East. That's our climate, the climate of climate change. Now, secondly, the inconvenient truths, to borrow a phrase, challenging climate change doomsday scenarios. Just want to offer some things that are evidently true if we would pay attention to them. There are, however, inconvenient truths that challenge cultural prophets who assert the demise of life by global warming and climate change. So I might begin by saying prophecy for mere mortals to assert the obvious is an inexact science. To predict the future with absolute certainty is not possible for mere mortals. And I think it's best left to one possessing omniscience. And that happens to be not us. That happens to be the I am that I am. The fallibility of human predictions is evident when we realize that we have long passed the 2014 date that Al Gore suggested 
for when the ice caps were to melt. Such dire predictions have proven to be greatly exaggerated. In fact, the ice actually grew in the year of Gore's claim, and they are freezing in remarkable ways. But isn't the Arctic melting, and aren't the polar bears dying? Well, recent counts of polar bear numbers show that they are flourishing more now than ever. And significantly, the Arctic ice cap is freezing. But isn't the Antarctic ice cap warming and melting? Well, that is only on one side of that continent. On the other side, it is freezing, and the temperatures there are plummeting colder than usual. And perhaps we've forgotten, but the climate change prophets cry only a half a century ago was for a looming new ice age. So who's got it right? It was 50 years ago, the new ice age, or is it the looming new, new climate warming that's going to burn the earth? A global warming advocate explains the imposition of climate change prognostication by an illustration of a man walking a dog on a leash. A dog being walked on a leash may go right or left with wide fluctuations. Have you ever walked a new puppy? Wow, that dog's all over the place, right? That's the weather. It's just back and forth, okay? But the issue is not the course the dog is taking on the leash, but the direction the man is walking. That's the climate. The climate, what direction is it going? It's a great illustration. A man is walking, and if he walks this way, the fluctuations. But, of course, the illustration is a, has an inherent problem. Uh, which direction is Mr. Climate Man going to go? Is he going to decide to turn the block this way, turn the block that way, or just keep walking? We have no way to know. Climate is something, even using the illustration, yes, there's wide fluctuation, yes, climate, but how do we know? That's the question. Eventually, the necessity arose to address the failures of the prophecies of global warming due to the inaccuracy of the prophets and record-breaking snows and freezing in various places around the world. A more accurate denomination of Earth's unpredictable weather was created, namely climate change. And I happen to think that's really a good title because uh, global warming may or may not be a fact, but climate change is a fact, and it is one that we will establish to be woven into the very revelation of Scripture. We are climate change believers if we believe the Bible. It's inherently necessary to do so. We can agree that this phrase is a more accurate title for what we observe as well in the weather and in the climate in our own lifetimes. After all, changing climates are the observable realities of Earth history. For example, the place where I grew up, northern Ohio. Okay, northern Ohio is a, a place right next to a big lake called Lake Erie. And you've heard about the Great Lakes, so I had fun growing up there. But you know, when I grew up, I used to see what were called glacial grooves, rocks that were carved by ice sheets. And you can still see the patterns that they wore right into, into the rock. There's what are called lateral and terminal moraines. That's big pieces of earth and soil and rocks that are just pushed, making little big mounds and hills all over. And you can see where the ice sheets once went. I lived on Johnny Cake Ridge. It's the, uh, a terminal moraine of a, a glacier. And where I grew up, there used to be a mile of ice over my home. That's not in my lifetime. But where I lived, they said that at least a mile of ice was there. And you know, it all melted about 10,000 years ago. And if I do my historical analysis right, that's about 10,000 years before the Industrial Revolution. It had nothing to do with human energy and work. What it shows us is that the Earth has been warming for a lot of centuries before we, human beings had anything to do with it. There is climate change in all around us, and that is part of natural history. It is something that we need to expect and explain away a mile of ice, except by global warming, but there was also global cooling. How did an, a mile thick layer of ice get there in the first place? That's examples that we could consider. The point is that global warming has been a steady reality for centuries, long preceding the Industrial Revolution. Yet amid that long stretch of global warming, there have also been substantial episodes of many ice ages, such as the one that occurred during the 1600s and the 1800s. This time of greater cold and freezing closed the northern water route from Europe to Russia. They used to be able to sail across the top, and that froze out and stopped. It created the denser hardwood that enabled the spectacular acoustics of the Stradivarius violins. 
You've all heard why the Stradivarius is so beautiful. And people have wondered, and they finally figured out. They analyzed the wood, and they said the wood that was at that time from the trees that were available were more dense than any wood found in history because they grew in a period of greater cold. And that denser wood gives greater acoustical properties. Stradivarius was a great artist, but he also had extraordinary materials uniquely made by a time of a mini ice age that impacted Europe. Similarly, as the frozen chunks of ice in the Delaware River that nearly stymied Washington's daring Christmas Day surprise attack of the Hessians at Trenton are reviewed, we see here the same fact of what that mini global ice age did. Today, uh, you will not see that river freezing. Then there are giant chunks of ice, and that was part of this colder area. In fact, scientists, I've read these articles, they talk about them, they're beginning to recognize that there is a natural 400-year cycle in the sun. The sun has a, a period by which it increases and cools over four centuries. We haven't had enough uh, temperature measuring to go back farther, but they're beginning to see patterns. And they're saying what we're looking at then is something that is part of the solar system. A significant fact about global warming needs to be taken into account. Did you know that there's Martian warming? The temperature on Mars has been measured for the last several decades, and they're discovering that the temperature on Mars is warming, and it has nothing to do with auto emissions on planet Earth. <laughs> it has everything to do with the power of the sun. We are in a warming sun, and the warming sun is a very powerful tool for changing climate that has been going on for centuries. So let's summarize some salient facts. Predictions of destructive climate change thus far have, been, have proven inaccurate. Secondly, empirical science cannot fully answer the question of global climate patterns. First, there's not enough evidence over multiple centuries to establish a solar cycle creating ice ages and warming eras. Earth history further cannot be repeated and measured, which is the foundational essence of empirical science. So like all historical interpretation, I'm a historian, and I realize that when you do historical evaluation, what you believe determines what facts you select and how you interpret them. And so it's going to be when you do earth history. We don't have observations. It is not science. It is scientism being motivated by a worldview. What you believe determines what you choose to measure and what you choose to describe. These are ideological viewpoints. We're often said, oh, you don't believe in science. I believe in science. I don't believe in scientism, atheistic, methodological research that rejects the creator. You say, wait a second, that means you don't see things that are true because you already denied them. I come at it by saying there's a creator, that we're in a created universe. We must recognize that scientism and science are not the same thing. The demi I could go on, but so therefore not all scientists are convinced of the catastrophic global warming perspective. I'll give you two quick sources if you'd like to go. Uh, just this morning I showed uh, Pastor Dan on Prager University, uh, a professor uh, that is the, a foundational scholar in the whole area of climate. He's written over 200 peer-reviewed articles in the area. He's the one of the first researchers on the impact of carbon emissions on the warming of the climate. Uh, you can go on it and find it. Just go on Prager University Climate Change and you'll go to Professor Happer, I think, is his name. He has all the credentials. And you know what he says at the end? He said, climate change is not science, it's science fiction. He said, it's people simplifying everything into an algorithm on a computer that does not describe reality, and they keep plugging in numbers that gives them the result that they want. He said, yeah, well, you can put in numbers and say in 100 years, the temperature is going to be two degrees higher. He said, it's utterly impossible. The greatest computers we have available cannot predict what uh, nature does. It's a five-minute uh, tour de force. I encourage you to take a look at that online. Because he is a scientist, I'm not. I'm saying, my goodness, he's a father of this field. And he said, what they're saying is science fiction, not science. That's pretty powerful when you think about it. Further, so uh, another source you might want to look at is the Cornwall Alliance led by Dr. Cal Beisner, a, a very fine scholar and uh, an evangelical reformed theologian. So here's a couple sources if you want a counter-narrative. Uh, but further, 
Let us remember the politics of global warming is an ever-present force for interpreting the data. It is a political issue. But remember, politics is not given to accuracy. With all the concern about the U.S. departure from the Paris Climate Accords, does it matter that the U.S. has led the way in the reduction of global emissions? Do you realize we're being attacked all the time? But the U.S. is one of the smallest polluters of the environment on the planet. The real issues are China and India and Indonesia. I've been to Beijing, and you know you can't see the sun. It's so cloudy and filled with pollution. I was in New Delhi, and I couldn't believe it. I could scarcely see from here to the end of the sanctuary. There was so much uh, pollution in the air. I've been to Bali in Indonesia, which is one of the great surfing islands, right? You want to go there and have a great vacation? I was uh, swimming at Kuta Beach, the great surfer, and it looked like I was swimming in a, in a junkyard. All the junk that was floating, and I thought, my God, this is one of the premier beaches. And so... Pollution is an issue, and we should take it seriously. We need to address it. The environment is precious. You know, if I'm your neighbor and you keep dumping garbage in your backyard, I'm going to start saying, would you finally get rid of that stuff? I have to live next to that. Can I help you clean it up? That's loving your neighbor and loving your community. We're not anti-environmentalists. We ought to say, we're glad we're doing a good job. Let's help others to address this issue. So as we think about it then, let's begin to engage thirdly some of the observable realities in favor of climate change. You can tell I've been challenging some of them. We must not deny the evidence that's in front of us. What is real and measurable and observable, we must take seriously. And we do it, the question is, how do we interpret what we see? Because you can see many facts and it can mean something else. And so the question is, how do we? So let's fully admit that the seas are rising. I was just in the Netherlands recently, and uh, I was talking to a very fine Reformed theologian. He said, uh, the Netherlands are taking the rising seas very, very seriously. You remember, they've reclaimed a great deal of land from the ocean through their dikes. And so if the ocean is rising, that's threatening a lot of their real estate. And they've taken it so seriously that they're reducing their national speed limit by 20 kilometers per hour to reduce emissions and heat. They say we want to do what we can to try to prevent the loss of our land by the rising seas. And my in fact, my friend said, it may be too late. We may lose a great deal of land because of the rising seas. And of course, that raises the question of what about U.S. coastal areas such as Florida and New York City? Uh, if there are rising seas, and by the way, I'm going to argue that rising seas have been going on for a long time. Be careful if you buy too much shore property you might want to have some property in the mountains, too. The, the seas are rising. We should not deny that. It's a fact. The evidence of warming is also clear. The ocean's uh, temperatures can be seen to be warmer. A beautiful example of this is the Ganges River uh, source up in the glacier mountains of the Himalayas. Uh, there was a, a marker that was put there in the year 1900 and said this is the extent of the glacier in the Himalayas that creates the Ganges River. If you go there today, there's something like 200 yards away that the, that the glacier has melted. The glacier's receding. And so there's global warming. There's glacial melting. The seas are rising. There's no doubt about this. And we hear stories such as this, cities running out of water as Cape Town, South Africa, and Chennai, India. The Great Barrier Reef is in decline and seems to be moving toward a state of dying. We cannot deny these things. They're real. We've heard about massive fires <clears throat> that have de devastated large swaths of California and Australia. And I love the, the mountains of California, and I have uh, certainly enjoyed hiking in Australia. I've climbed Ayers Rock, that big giant freestanding rock in the middle of Australia. I had to climb it because it's, my name is Peter, which means a rock. So I had to climb the biggest rock on the planet as a hiker. So I've done it twice. It's a wonderful thing. Okay? And uh, we've already said pollution is a huge issue. We should be concerned about the pollution of that, that we see around and, and the corruption of the environment. These are things we should care about. Why? Because God made it very good. We're to care for the environment. It's not something that we should. Like I said, I love trees. I'm a tree hugger. I'm a hiker. I love the out of doors. I don't want to see us destroy the environment. Now, what do we do with all that? Now, these things that I've observed, let me offer some interpretations that we should take seriously. 
I first of all identified the fact that solar warming is a fact and it is not explained by human activity. It is real and it is impacting other planets in our solar system that we have nothing to do with. If Mars is warming up because of the sun, well then, a fortiori, so is the Earth. We're closer to the sun. There's a long history of ice age melting that's evident in Earth history. The ancient rise of the seas closed the Bering land bridge between Alaska and Russia, and glacial melting created the Great Lakes. Global warming has been a reality for multiple centuries. California fires and Australia fires are serious. They are indeed tragic, but you know they are likely due because of lack of attention to the natural things that we should do. Uh, the power companies in California have admitted they did not take enough attention to their power transmission and that the fires were created by electrical transmission that was not properly installed. They created the sparks that created the fire because they didn't install it carefully. And further in Australia, they're saying one of the things with the expanse of civilization is that they have not followed the practice of the aboriginals that regularly would take and burn the underbrush in areas where there were known to be fires. By doing that, they were able to prevent the massive burnouts they'd learned for centuries. And us wise kind of Westerners just didn't do it. Ancient wisdom showed. The same thing has also been true in California. They've given up the ancient practice of burning underbrush to prevent the massive fires. We are culpable, not because we are making the earth too hot. It's because we're not taking care of what we know to do and our speed to do things and not paying attention. Now, this to me is one of the most remarkable facts. Globally, there are numerous submerged ancient coastal cities indicating that the seas have risen some 200 to 300 feet through human civilization. This is all without the impact of industrialization and human fossil fuel emissions. Uh, just uh, in the last few years, about three miles off the coast of Western India, they discovered a massive ancient city of India, a civilization that's totally lost and forgotten. It's under 200 feet of water. That shows you that once that was a coastal city, but the seas in human history have raised that much and it had nothing to do with carbon emissions from industrialization. We are in a warming planet phase. That's just a fact. Polar caps are impacted by, uh, as we say, this solar heating and cooling process. The water shortages that we've seen are identifiable entirely to the lack of human planning. Uh, the, Cape Town has never had enough water. And they were able to address it by wise planning, just like you do here in Dallas. We have large reserves. When the uh, change of government occurred with the ending of some of the problems in South Africa, they failed to pay attention to the water needs, and they ran out of water. Not because there's not enough water, it's because they didn't care for it. You're living in a desert climate. You better make sure you have the ability to collect enough water to live as you have a growing population. <clears throat> there's so much more I could say about this, but what I want to say is that there is a great deal of evidence that is being suppressed in the interpretation for one direction, to blame everything on human activity. And there's all sorts of counter-narrative that is factual, that should be considered seriously. In fact, historians of meteorology have argued that with all the claims for extreme weather, that the historical records show that we have been living through a very mild period of tornadoes and hurricanes compared to the past centuries beforehand. We've had serious weather, but there was more serious weather before us, which is quite a remarkable thing. So there's the background. That's my attempt as a humble layman, just looking and reading and hearing things around us and saying, what do we see? How do we interpret it? But now let's, our remaining time, turn to the scriptures. So how does the Bible help us interpret this? And I'm going to call this redemptive historical theological themes, looking at what does the Bible say about climate change? The first thing that I want you to know is that a biblical history of climate change affirms that the climate has continuously changed in the history of human life. Climate change is a reality. It is biblical, and we should not run from it. We should embrace it and say it's absolutely true. We can see this as we look at those great themes of creation, fall, curse, and flood. You know your Bible, Genesis 1 through 11. You read that story. It's a story of climate change. 
We, we remember the goodness of creation that God made and the, the mandate given for mankind to develop and uh, fill it. God gives man the breath of life and he bears his image. And the creation ordinances give him this great natural world with rivers flowing, with food to eat, with gold to be found, natural resources. You see that image. Adam is given the gift of agriculture to care for it and tend the garden and increase its yield as he shows rule over it. In fact, he was naked and Eve was naked. And we see that's not only a purity of morals that was not there, but it describes the environment. They didn't even need clothing. The environment was so perfect that clothing was unnecessary. You know what? I, I bring a coat along with me, even when I come to Dallas these days, because I'm getting old. And I say, I better have it, because I got to... I, of course, I want to hide my midsection a little bit, too. You know, that's why I always wear a tie. It kind of blends the angles a little bit. <laughs> now, you're not supposed to laugh at that. You're supposed to, to, to moan with me and pray for me. Okay. The point is, is that we wear clothing not only because of modesty, but because of climate. They didn't even have to wear clothes. The climate was entirely different than what we know today. It was a, it was a different world. <clears throat> but the curse, as you know, when sin entered into the world... Uh, we discover that everything changed. The, there was the curse that was placed upon the ground. Thorns and thistles will come up. Uh, we know that in the middle of that, there was common grace. The Lord said, yes, there will be children. Yes, there will be food. Yes, there will be a redeemer someday that will crush the head of the serpent. But you're going to have a hard work of it. You're gonna, there's going to be blood, sweat, and tears for you to make your way through this world. The curse is part of history. And you remember that's even intensified in the story of Cain and Abel. A Cain is told that the earth is even going to be harder on you for what you've done because the earth is crying out from the blood of your brother whom you've slain. Fratricide, one of the first sins of humanity. Tragic. Shows how broken and fallen we are. And so this is the, brings to the point where the Lord finally says, I'm going to destroy the entire earth. Okay, so now notice, there was a paradise a radical climate change for a curse, an intensification of the climate to even be more cursed until the point that there's a radical apocalyptic judgment. The flood, the universal flood that destroys humanity because man's thoughts and hearts were only evil continually before the Lord. And so total destruction occurs. And out of this then comes a next step. We have creation, fall, curse, and flood. All of them are impacting the climate. And then we come to the establishment of what we call the covenant with Noah, the Noahic covenant. The covenant with Noah is remarkable in biblical history because it tells us that the climate that had been changing under judgment finds a new stability, a certainty that was not part of the previous world. So stop and think about what we know from Genesis 8 and following. God establishes a covenant with creation and with mankind that anticipates the ultimate redemption. But it brings about a climate change from what had preceded the flood, and that climate change is one of stability. God promises that there will be human good, that God's providence will care for the earth. His blessings include that the curse that was known on the earth that was so severe would be removed. Not entirely, but it would be lessened. The earth would become more fruitful. The universal destruction of the earth will bring forth now a new divine establishment of cycles of seed time, harvest, cold and heat. God's common grace to fall in mankind therefore preserves crop production and the climate. So for example, listen to these words in Genesis 8, 21 and following. The promise of a non-repeating of a universal destruction of human life by the flood. The Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. Further, he specifies how this non-repeat of the flood will be followed by a stability in the climate that was not part of the previous world. In Genesis 8.22, it says, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, Summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Okay, now this is a very important point for us. We have to decide, are the climate prognosticators of destruction of life speaking the truth? Or is God speaking the truth? That claim is a direct assault on what God established when he spoke to Noah. 
And that is a worldview question for us. Who do we believe? God said, as a promise to Noah and his descendants, which <clears throat> includes us, he says, while the earth remains, that means as long as there's an earth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. That says, this is what we are going to look at with our climate. Now, we're not saying there are not variations within the climate. There is climate change. But the stability of a climate that will enable human life is in place. That is denied. Scriptures say this is what is true. Okay? Now, this divine blessing it goes on in Genesis 9, 1 through 7, why the Lord says, I've given you all food, including now, you'll remember, even uh, animals to, as part of our food source. The repetition of the creation mandate, be fruitful and multiply. And then the establishment of civil government that includes what we spoke about yesterday, the legitimacy of using the sword for human order. The magistrate does not bear the sword in vain. The right to protect life by the taking of life. Capital punishment is well within the right of the magistrate. Whether it's just or not is another question. Are we doing it justly? But it is within the boundaries of God's establishment of the Noahic order. Now, so what we find after Noah then is the intensification of what the Lord says about this new climate reality after the flood. The post-flood divine reaffirmations of this common grace include a reiteration of God's promises for such things as rain and harvest. These are the things we're told. Rain's going to stop. The harvests are going to disappear. People are going to starve. Life is going to end. Listen to what the Lord says. Psalm 104, verse 9. Uh, you set a boundary that they, the waters, may not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. There's a limit to how high the seas can rise. Sea and rain and seasons are assured. Jeremiah 5, to 24. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? I place the sand as a boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that it cannot pass. Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over it. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They've turned aside and gone away. They do not say in their hearts, let us fear the Lord our God, who gives the rain in its season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. That is a reiteration of God's Noahic covenant, that God's sea time and harvest. There's going to be variations. There's tragedies in history. Yes, meteorological damage happens by, well, we just saw it when I drove up here, tornadoes. The Bible doesn't deny these sorts of things. But it says the assurance of the cultural stability of climate that will fulfill God's purpose is secure by his promise. Now listen to this very carefully. It is even intensified. It's not just that the Noahic covenant is established, that there are post-flood divine reaffirmations of this common grace, but what happens next is that the special grace of redemption is tied to God's promise of climate stability. What he's saying is the gospel that you believe is inseparably connected to the stability of the climate. If I'm interpreting this right, it says, if you believe in the global destruction of the earth, by climate means from human beings, you have to deny the cross of Jesus Christ. Okay, let's see if I can make that case. That's a pretty powerful claim. I'm not saying there aren't changes in the climate. I'm saying the destruction of human life by climate changes that destroys human beings and takes away life is a denial of God's redemptive plan in history Okay, God's providential sustaining of nature is inextricably bound with his plan for redeeming grace. Israel's permanence is guaranteed by God's fixed preservation of the cosmos. The perpetuity of God's people as the birth line of the Messiah is immutably linked to the fixity of God's order in nature. I put it this way, the fixed order of the sun, moon, stars, sea, immeasurable space, and earth's geological depths assure Israel's offspring's continued existence. Listen to Jeremiah 31, verses 35 to 37. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and, and the fixed order of the moon, and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that it waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. 
The permanence of the nation of Israel called to bring forth the Messiah is tied to the stability of the climate. That's intensified even more fully in Jeremiah 33, 19 and following. God's natural covenant with the appointed times of the cycle of day and night and the fixed order of the heavens guarantee that a descendant of David will be on his throne in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. David's descendants can also be understood, therefore, by looking to nature, namely to the immeasurable quantity of sand on the seashore. Jeremiah puts it this way. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne. And the covenant with the priests, my ministers, as the host of the heavens cannot be numbered and the sands of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David, my servant, and the priests who minister to me. If I have not established my covenant with day and night in the fixed order of heaven and earth, then I will reject the offspring of Jacob and David and will not choose one of his offspring to rule over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will restore their fortunes and will have mercy on them. This is the greater David, the promised Messiah. The Lord says, I have established a plan and it will not end. I will bring forth through Israel my Messiah who will reign upon his throne. And if that doesn't happen, the earth will disappear. In other words, redemption and creation are inextricably connected in God's plan. And so that brings us to fifthly, the Bible's clear answer to the foundational question of the climate change debate. Can man destroy the divinely established order of nature, even though God will never do so based on his common grace promises? that support his gracious plan of salvation in the Messiah. In my opinion, this would only be possible if man lived in a neutral universe, if he was autonomous and essentially sovereign in his actions, and the universe is devoid of God. But this is not man's world. This is God's world. God does not relinquish his providence in any aspect of his realm to his creatures. God will overcome human evil with his good. Redemption, resurrection, finally new creation. Biblically, it is not possible for mankind to thwart God's purpose and promises. God is sovereign. We sing, this is my father's world. We don't say, this is the climate changer's world. This is God's world. God is the one who's speaking about his creation and his plan. He is his providence that upholds us. Our sovereign God's promise, providence, and prophetic purpose make the universal catastrophe prophesied by global warming alarmists impossible on a biblical basis. And therefore, I'd like to suggest it's time that we recover the true meaning of the rainbow. Don't you cringe today when you see the rainbow? Oh, LGBTQ, they're trying to destroy the family. They have all these different values. Guess what? They've hijacked the rainbow. The rainbow belongs to you. God gave it to all of us. And what did he say by the rainbow? God puts the rainbow, you know, as a hiker, I'm a tree hugger, I'm a rainbow lover too. When I'm out hiking, I've been inundated. And you know, when you're out hiking, there's no place to run when it decides to pour. But sometimes there's a great blessing for getting that It's a Presbyterian baptism. Water's coming from above, you know. So you get this Presbyterian baptism. I'm I'm all soaking wet and I'm walking along. And all of a sudden, there's this big rainbow in the sky. You know what I think? I don't think LGBTQ. I say, praise God. The earth is still secure. The Lord is going to uphold his promise. He's given a sacramental sign for everyone to see if they have eyes to see and ears to hear. And if they'll look at his word, he's saying, heaven and earth It's going to be here until all that God has said in his word is accomplished. Seed time and harvest, day and night, all of the blessings of God in seasons and harvest and planting are all secure. That means I'll get to hike again next year if the Lord gives me life and health. The world's going to be here. He's not giving up on us. Brothers and sisters in Christ, reclaim the rainbow. It's yours. And it smacks this worldview right in the face. Say, that's not true. God says this world, he's given us a sign again and again. His word is sure. The Bible's clear answer is that this rainbow is a sign of natural common grace, blessing, preserving the earth and human life from the destruction of a universal deluge. 
But, you know, we can go on beyond that. Once we begin to see, all right, climate change is biblical. We see that there have been radical climate changes in the history. Now there is a general vast stability in the climate that will have variations for sure, rising seas, maybe declining seas. There can be all sorts of different things going on. But there is a general fixedness in the universe based upon God's promise and his giving of the Messiah that must come in history. But the moment that you yield to that, then you have other implications of what the Messiah has said. It guaranteed the Messiah would come, and then the Messiah made prophecies. And we begin to build what I would call several biblical considerations. Why global warming that will create climate destruction for human beings is impossible. What God has said through his Messiah about the world and what's to come makes this eschatology of doomsday destruction impossible. First of all, let's remember God is sovereign. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He's not like Al Gore, who said, well, the ice caps will melt by 2014, and he was wrong. The Lord declares the end from the beginning, for there's none that can stay his hand. He works all things after the counsel of his own will. Every hair on your head is numbered, according to Dr. Mehmet Oz, on my favorite online doctor. He said you have 150,000 on average on your head. Did you count them yet? God changed the count when you combed it this morning. He said, not even a sparrow will fall to the ground apart from God's will. God sees every one of them. And, they're all, and, and Jesus is day two for sold for a penny. Did you know there are over 540 million sparrows in North America? There's more than one for each of us in North America. God knows every one, every one that falls. God knows it. Don't you think he's concerned about the bigger questions too? Like, will seed time and harvest continue? God's providence sustains. He's sovereign. He knows the end from the beginning. He has further a plan that will be fully realized and effectual. He will work out his eternal decree, his sovereign plan through his providence and preservation. Colossians 1 say that all things consist in the hand of Jesus Christ. He's the one that's holding the fabric of the universe together. Is he going to let it go? He has a plan. Thirdly, the seas, as we've already seen, will not create a global flood that will destroy the entire earth. There will be up rising and falling. There'll be tsunamis. There'll be storms. There's crashing waves. But the fixity of even the land masses that God has are in his care. God has made a covenant with the seed of Abraham, his elect, and with the cosmos itself. He will not break his covenant. God's word is irrevocable. What he has declared will surely stand. There's nothing that will change his mind. No one can stay his hand. And Nebuchadnezzar learned that well, remember? He said, wow, the Lord is the God of the kings of the universe. These promises of divine preservation of nature for man's good are reiterated in numerous biblical texts. In my notes, I have about seven pages of one verse after another saying the rain is coming, the harvest is coming, seasons are coming, God's blessings are coming. It's, so what's the great answer to climate change? Read your Bible. It says, yeah, there's been climate change and there'll be variations, but God has a plan and his purpose will stand. God is a creator and preserver. His providential preservation brings good gifts to man. Remember James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And why do we have them? Because with God, there is no variation. There is no shadow due to change. The fixity of the universe based on God's promise is absolutely secure because of the immutability and perfection of God himself who gives us these good gifts. Further, we can consider this. His prophecy, the Messiah's prophecies of the end times is certain. He can declare the end from the beginning. What does he say? In his prophecy, he says, there will be people alive and nations functioning when he returns. He's not saying, oh boy, I'm going to come back and all life is dead on earth. What happened? When he comes back, there will be people here. This is what the Lord says. The Son of Man will come to be glorified and feared by all the humans and nations alive. While much is unclear and unknowable, we could debate eschatology. This much is clear. We all will agree if we study. People will still be here, so there will be no population annihilation. At the second advent, there will not only be the resurrection of the dead, but the change of the living. There will be suffering and plenty then, just like now, for it will be like it was in the days of Noah. 
What Noah saw, we will see the same kind of life. The climate has changed because of the Noahic covenant, but the reality of human life, so that nations will still be here. Throughout history, nations rise against nation, but the end is not yet. And so that reminds us then that this cycle of sorrows, of war, rumors of war, famine, earthquakes, pestilence, drought, whirlwinds, tsunamis will continue in this fallen world until God determines to end it at his time and in his eschatological purpose. Further, he will spare his people amidst this final eschatological judgment. And thus, by special grace and common grace, humanity will be spared for the ultimate fulfillment of his plan. We know that ultimately the curse itself will be removed from this world. And some of the most majestic words we find in the Bible in Romans 8, 18 and following, the Apostle Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. He said, yes, in this general fixity of the climate, there is a great deal of suffering. We don't deny it. There are famines. There are struggles. There are droughts. There are floods. There are earthquakes. There are all sorts of difficulties. There's suffering. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. What is that saying? There's another great climate change coming when it will transcend even the paradise that God gave when he creates the new heavens and the new earth. There'll be a, a transcendentally glorious climate that we await that God will give in the new heavens and the earth. So even as we read in Revelation 4.11, the Lord's delight in his creation. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And so the day will come when the Lord will delight even more in his new creation, the new climate that's yet to come from the one that is beautiful but damaged, but is anticipating something far more wonderful. Well, our time is nearly up. And as you might expect, I have far more than I can tell you. But uh, let me try to give you a conclusion here, some biblical evaluation of climate change claims. The first thing that I want to say is, let us be, if you like hiking, be a tree hugger like me. But I don't worship trees. I don't worship nature gods. You know, it's interesting, the atheism that surrounds us today has reestablished the gods of the past, the gods of nature. They bow before it and genuflect before nature. Say, this is our God. This is Mother Earth. If we don't have this, we have nothing. Instead, it's the creator and the creature. The creation is under the creator. We worship the creator. And because we worship the creator, we delight in his works. It's his creation. We love it. We should love this world. We should love the rainbow. We should love the sunsets. We should love the seas. And we see our front yard is messed up. We ought to take care of it and make it a little bit better. We're to rule over the earth. We're to do it as many followers of the great creator. That's a great privilege. Let us remember that while God is absolutely sovereign, he does not diminish the importance of secondary causes. So let us not be guilty of being polluters of the great environment that he's given us. Let us use our responsibility. If we are industrialists, let's make sure we clean up our waste. If we are going on a picnic, let's don't throw litter on the ground so someone else has to deal with it. Let's pray about those homeless people that are destroying the public sidewalks, that they can, that safety and health, especially with the coronavirus now, that we find a way to love them and take care of our environment that is being damaged and polluted by lack of attention to their needs. Autonomous human reason, thirdly, remember, is limited, and therefore we are blessed. We are not blind by just the limitations of natural reason. We have the ability to see things that we never know because God has spoken. We have a word from God. We have the mind of God. And when we use that, our worldview lets see things that no natural man can ever see. We have God's promises. And yes, we recognize there can be catastrophic events. There may, may be eschatological harbingers that God might use that might be an asteroid that hits the earth and there might be great earthquakes and who knows. But Lord is going to see his people through this to be his witnesses in all those cases. So there's much more we could say. But let me finish up with this. 
I think it's time for us to reject what I call chicken little theology. Remember the parable of chicken little? You don't find it in Jesus, but it is a good parable. Okay, Let me just read what I have here as we conclude. Chicken Little is a folktale that has roots that go back for some two and a half millennia. It is a morality tale about a chicken who believes the world is coming to an end. The phrase, the sky is falling, is the heart of the story. The fable is a metaphor for the hysterical belief that disaster is imminent. Chicken Little believes the sky is falling when an acorn falls on its head. He decides to tell the king, And on the journey to the throne meets other animals, which he persuades to join his quest. So his movement escalates as the inconvenient truth of the falling sky engages Henny Penny and Cocky Locky and Ducky Lucky and Drakey Lakey and Goosey Lucy and Gander Lander and Turkey Lurkey and Foxy Loxy. Boy, that's quite a name for a congressman, isn't it? (laughs) So Sly Foxy Loxy invites them to his lair and he eats them all. The moral to be learned is clear. The gullible birds are eaten by the fox, and similarly, disaster will fall to others who believe everything one is told. So what does Chicken Little say to us today? The seas are rising. He's right, for this is the acorn that has fallen on our heads. But he is right to be terrified, but is he right to be terrified about the imminent disaster of the end of life? Rather, let us fear that the sly fox of massive government overreach and control will end up devouring our freedoms as we've allowed a cyclical event of natural order to drive us to hysteria and to the foolish end of freedom. Let us be responsible citizens, but as those with firm confidence in the promises of our Creator, let us engage this phase of His vast cycle of climate under sovereign control with confidence and joy. Because our God rules, and he declares the end from the beginning. And he says, when I come back, I will change the living to be like me, and I'll raise the dead. This world will not pass away as long as there is a rainbow in the sky. And the rainbow and the cross are inextricably connected. Let that be part of your understanding of the world you live in. Lord, would you bless this time of study? Thank you for the joy we have. We pray that you will preserve foolishness from my remarks, that you'd help us to be clear, and that we would be good stewards of this beautiful creation you've given us. But let us not forever deny the truths that you've granted to us. We thank you for them in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed, I believe.